The president is a raving lunatic. He is not well. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Andrew Gillum, the former Democratic mayor of Tallahassee, who came in second in last year's race for governor in Florida. He was echoing what has become mainstream thinking now about the mental health of the president of the United States during a week in which the president has said he is the king of the Jews, the second coming of God, the chosen one. It is the same week in which even though he sees himself as a king, a god, a chosen one, Denmark somehow found the strength to defy him and refuse to sell Greenland to the United States. And so the president, the king, the god, says he canceled the trip to Denmark, even though he probably canceled the trip to Denmark because he knows President Obama is scheduled to go to Denmark a few weeks after what would have been the Trump trip and President Obama would surely get a much more positive reception from a much, much bigger crowd than Donald Trump could have mustered in Denmark. All of that sounds pretty crazy to sober, careful politicians like Andrew Gillum, who have never before called a political opponent a raving lunatic. Well, we told you so. One month into the Trump presidency, we had our first discussion of the president's mental health on this program with psychologist John Gartner and former professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, Lance Dotis. If we could construct a psychiatric Frankenstein monster, we could not create a leader more dangerously mentally ill than Donald Trump. He's a paranoid, psychopathic narcissist who's divorced from reality and lashes out impulsively at his imagined enemies. He lies because of his sociopathic tendencies that Dr. Gartner was talking about, that he lies in the way anybody who scams people does, that he's trying to sell uh, an idea or a product by telling you something that's untrue. There's that lying. There's also the kind of lying he has that is, uh, in a way, more serious, that he has a loose grip on reality. If he was a paranoid schizophrenic and he was wearing a tinfoil hat, then he wouldn't be elected president. But he's just sane enough, as it were, to uh, pass, but actually detached from reality, as Dr. Dota said, so that what is real uh, is fluid. Uh, it's totally... Um, uh, malleable according to his personality disorder. Later that year, Dr. Gartner and Dr. Dotas contributed articles to the book The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. A new edition of that book was published this year with 10 more entries, which then changed the subtitle to 37 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. In that book, Dr. Dotis writes, Mr. Trump's sociopathic characteristics are undeniable. They create a profound danger for America's democracy and safety. Over time, these characteristics will only become worse. And joining our discussion now, once again, is Dr. Lance Dotis, a former assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and an analyst at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. Dr. Dotis, thank you very much for joining us once again. My and pleasure. you told us in 2017, that it was going to get worse. It will, your, your words will only become worse. Is that what we're seeing this week? Absolutely. Uh, Donald Trump, because he has a fundamental need to be all powerful and all loved, can't stand challenges. And the nature of democracy is that it challenges people. We have more than one opinion. So the more it was predictable that it, once he got into a position where people would challenge him, there are two parties, uh, he would become more unhinged. In the uh, interview today, for example, on the uh, South Lawn of the White House, he showed that. As you watched him respond to people, the more they challenged him, the more uh, he ranted. He stopped responding to the questions, and instead he started to talk about how people were uh, agents of fake, fake news. He, uh, he said that uh, they would um, go out of business soon. Basically, that they would die. Uh, that uh, NBC and, um, um, uh, and the New York Times would be dead within six years. Th this is the same kind of thing that he did when he was a candidate and when he suggested that someone protesting at his campaign uh, rally be taken out and beaten up. He can't stand anything that disagrees with him, and the more you challenge him, the more unhinged he becomes, the more paranoid and um, the more violent, potentially. 
Uh, today he's saying that uh, the reason he's canceling his trip to Denmark uh, is that the prime minister used the word absurd uh, to describe Donald Trump's idea. And he kept saying uh, and repeatedly in that uh, the talk to reporters you're talking about today, repeatedly saying that was such a nasty word, it was such a bad word to use, the word absurd. I want to I want to hold that in our minds when we consider Donald Trump's relationship to Kim Jong Un, who he used to call Rocket Man. That's what Donald Trump used to call him. And at the same time that he was calling him Rocket Man, Kim Jong Un was calling him the mentally deranged U.S. dotard. Uh, and and then eventually, after all of that, Doctor uh, Donald Trump then eventually turned into the guy who loves Kim Jong-un. Let's, let's listen to that part of it. And then we fell in love, okay? No, really. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. What are we seeing in all of that? He cancels a trip because of the word absurd. The guy who calls him uh, a mentally deranged U.S. dotard is someone he then eventually falls in love with? Well, he, he doesn't really love anyone except himself. Uh, that's not a, a slur. That's a psychological fact. People like him are about him. And we see this not only with the North Korean leader, but with all the people he surrounded himself uh, for most of his life who are now uh, recognized as criminals. As long as they stay loyal to him, he loves them. As soon as they challenge him, as soon as they disagree, then they're terrible people, which he has said about each of these folks. So, uh, of course, it means nothing. He never loved him. He only used him. And if he's not useful to him, then he stops loving him. That's part of the essential emptiness of Donald Trump. He doesn't have real uh, relationships with people. That let, maybe his personal family, we don't know about that. But you can see that he uh, discards anyone who doesn't fit his personal needs, which makes him... Uh, 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 unable to uh, really relate to uh, our allies as well as our enemies. And, Doctor, we need your analysis of a president who stands up and compares himself to a king, refers to himself as king of the Jews, uh, refers to himself in a godlike way, uh, turns to the heavens today and calls himself uh, a, the chosen one. What is that? Well, it's obviously grandiosity, but I, I want to make clear that there are a lot of grandiose people. There are a lot of people who are narcissistic. Donald Trump goes way beyond that. There is a fundamental way in which, as I said, he's empty. There is something fundamentally different about him from normal people. There is there's a it's, it's a psychotic like state. The more you press him, the more you see how disorganized and empty he is, the more he flies into a disorganized rage. So, uh, yeah. And by the way, in terms of being God, he also made several what you might call Freudian slips during the interview today. He kept mixing up who he was and who the country was. He said, I have the best economy. I, not the country. I defeated the caliphate. It's not just a, a slip of the tongue. He really doesn't get it. He thinks of himself as a dictator, and it's all him, and no one else really matters. Dr. Lance Dotis, thank you for joining us once again, and thank you for starting this conversation here on this program uh, back in the what was the second month, basically, of the Trump presidency, when I know it wasn't comfortable for people in, in your profession to be entering this discussion. But as you said at that time, you felt more driven by the duty to warn, and that's what you've been uh, joined in tonight. We really appreciate that. Sure. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on the button below for more from The Last Word and the rest of MSNBC.